call myself in my LinkedIn profile, almost other things, a social media practitioner. I certainly am not an expert. I practice, so I tweet, I Facebook, I blog. So I intend here today, at least in terms of the blogging 101, is to give you some, at least some of the ideas, some of the experiences, learnings that I've encountered that hopefully will answer your question. So, you know, starting a block. Well, if, in terms of the overall piece, um, and the one slide I may, I'll refer to, this is my own presentation. If you want the one slide, I can give it to you, it's a PDF. <clears throat> I tend to refer to it, and this is one of the other reasons why I do have the hat. Three, try corner. Content, conversation, community. Right? So what is your content? Why do you want to blog? What are you trying to do with your blog? Those kinds of questions you're going to need to answer. And I'm sure each of you will have different answers because I know in my own life I probably have, <coughs> probably could have, but I know I definitely have had probably about six different blogs for different reasons. Right? So Steve's two cents. That blogspot.com is kind of my home page. This is kind of like me. But most of my blogging is done at franklinmatters.org, where I'm a citizen's journalist reporting on the budget, town council, what's happening in Franklin Mass, because it's not covered by the media places. Right? And then as part of that, it kind of gravitated. So I started helping the Franklin Climate Action, Climate Action Team the Franklin Historical Museum, Franklin Downtown Partners, and now the Franklin Food Pantry. Right? All getting them up with a web presence, a blog, YouTube channel where it's appropriate, a Twitter account, Facebook page, because it's content. And then the second question you're going to need, is if you're in a business or even in just an individual, you've got a reason to blog. Right? And it's Depending upon that reason, you've got some engagement, right? So you want to have some conversation, which is the second C. And then the third C is the community, right? So now that I've created a blog for Franklin, if you live in Franklin, you'll come and find out, oh, that's where the town council meeting minutes are. There's a proposal to put a school next to her house, and I don't want it there. I want it over there. Now you start getting into the community aspects of it, right? So, people will come and say, you know, what's going on, etc. The other side of the community aspect is, and I don't have to post everything all the time, I now get from the Boy Scout troops, the soccer teams, the other organizations who want to share information, like public service announcements, they send stuff to me, hey Steve, we're doing a cake sale, hey Steve, we're doing, I'll post it, absolutely, right? So that's content. And as long as it matters to somebody in Franklin, I'll post it. So, yeah, as a car rally, I don't do ads. I don't have paid advertising, and I don't charge companies to do that. It's free. You should have that information. And if it matters to somebody, specifically a church or an organization, to get their word up, boom. Yes, I'll do the notice. And then over time, if it really gets important, like that's how the Franklin Food Pantry got me involved, is that, hey, we, want, we don't have a website. A lot of people, even though Franklin's kind of our up-and-coming town, rather wealthy, they have a food pantry because it's still needed. And even more so recently over the last couple of years. So we've created a website, getting the awareness. We've created a new logo because we want to get away from the old food pantry interviews. You have to go there because some of our clients are finding out, I want to talk about going to the food pantry because it's not something you normally talk about. If you need to go, you gotta go. So we're trying to get the image changed to be more like a library. You don't hesitate saying, I'm going to the library. I'm going to get a book. Why would you hesitate? So we're trying to do that. So that's part of our own change. So back to kind of the long-winded answer around content. What are you really trying to do? What is your presence? Context leading to conversation. So if you create the engagement stuff, and we'll get into a little bit more of that, some things work better than others. Pictures tend to work very well on Facebook. 
So then you also say, and we'll get into more, how do you do it all? Well, if you do the post with a picture and then put it to Facebook, the picture's already there. So half the work has already been done. You know, being smart about what you're doing to reuse. I don't want it. If I'm going to type and spend some time typing, I'll do it right. And then reuse as much as possible elsewhere. So I don't have to create a separate Facebook post. I don't have to create a separate tweet. I may add some things to it to specifically target that particular market. And then also make it engaging. So if I say something, all right, I just posted this. Well, what do you think about it? I want to get some involvement other than just the like. And this is where we can go into an entire other session, but that would probably be 102 or 103. Because if you want to go from conversation to conversion, to actually get some dollars for what you're doing, that's another talk. That's another talk. And I'll defer to somebody else on that, because I don't do that. <laughs> so content, conversation, community. Those are kind of the three Cs. The other one that I'll uh, mention by way of a story, um, content in context is important. Right? So summer day, Western Mass, hay fields, gorgeous greenery, sun is shining probably as light as today, but the growth, the foliage, it's just, you know, one of those great summer days. Driving along the back roads, start getting a little curvy, a little windy come across a hand-painted sign, vegetables for sale. Of course, it says fresh vegetables for sale. So you can just bet, hand-painted sign in that setting, those vegetables probably had the dew on them in the morning, and they were indeed fresh because they came from these fields. All right? So content in context. Same road, same day, further down the road, Similar sign, hand-painted, free flying lessons. <laughs> now, it may be that the mechanic who does so well at the farmer's tractor doing all that has this part-time thing where he just likes to take a joyride. But content in the context, does it create the same kind of safety feeling, <laughs> free flying lessons? Right? So be careful of what you're doing. Right? So some tweets are going to be more appropriate, some blog posts are going to be more appropriate. And you can deep, you don't have to be like 99999 all the time on your blog. Because if people trust you and understand you, they'll let you deviate. Because that's okay. There's more than just whatever you're doing. They'll let you, you know, expand a little bit. But as long as it's in context. So if you start going every which way, they're going to figure out, well, what is the context? And if they don't want that, they'll leave. So, um, three levels of engagement. So there's uh, three levels of audience, I guess. And again, keeping with the threes. Um, you've got the big wide world, and a good portion of the folks have no clue as to your blog, website, Facebook page. No clue. May not even be on, may be on, doesn't matter, they don't have a clue. But if in the content you now hit one of their interests, eventually they'll find you, assuming you're findable. Right? And that gets into the entire search engine optimization on the one hand, but content. So if you're doing the right stuff with the right terms for what you're doing, somebody somewhere will find you, right? So if you Google school business administrator interview questions, nine times out of 10, you'll land on Franklin Matters as the first piece in the Google search. Because that happened to have been a headline when the school committee was interviewing for the new school business administrator, and they gave me the 14 questions that the seven of them were asking, and I posted that. And that has been the number one post <laughs> since I created it in March of 2008. It's what they also call singularity. It's just that set of words that brings you right to your site. 
And it's amazing. People from around the world, anybody in the English-speaking world, who is looking for a town council, a school committee, budgets, half my traffic is still coming in from outside Franklin, Mass. School business administrator interview questions. It should be on the first page. It's usually number one. So we'll test and see. Maybe somebody else has done something in the meantime. But. The other thing before we get into the specific questions, I think, audience and location. If you've determined what your content, your reason to be is, who is your audience? Who do you really want to reach? Is going to be a key question. You need to know them, know how to reach them, know how to talk to them, know how to talk in their language. And if that content is really what drives you, that can come easy for you. Or simply by being in it, if it's something that's new to you and you're really passionate about it, you're going to learn that language and thereby reach them as well. The third piece is, or related to that, is where are they? If they're in that demographic that is, what, the high demographic is 30 to 50 female is on Facebook. If that's the demographic, then you want to have a Facebook presence to get them. Maybe Pinterest is better because it has the pictures and it's also high demographic in the female. If you're looking for eight, 15 to 18 males, don't go to Facebook. You want a text system because that's where that demographic is texting back and forth. Do you always write in the first person? Um, no. Sometimes no. you do or sometimes? Yes. Um, and generally, in, in, from a Franklin Matters perspective, I'm reporting, so it's generally in the third person. But occasionally, and I'll say occasionally, I'll say editorial, this is my view on what's happening. But my information primarily is this is the story. This is what they said. This is why they said it. These are the documents. These are the numbers. You make your own decision. So the definition of the blog is really expanded. It's now like a bulletin. It, it can be anything. For as many people in the room, you can have as many blogs with as many purposes, and they're all going to be valid for that purpose. <clears throat> That's what you want to do. On Steve's two cents, I tend to be much more in I did this, I did that. Not a friend that matters. Different point, different focus. Not a food pantry page. Different purpose, different focus. So it'll vary. Location. So one of the key pieces and one of the reasons why, if you're going to blog, certainly focus on the blogging and then gradually add the other services because you can increase your findability, at least via Google and the search, by having more and more references. So now you're more complete if you also have you know, the Twitter account. And there are tools, and we can go into another session potentially on that, in terms of how you can blog and then automatically create a tweet. So now your blog has two links from Google Juice. And then if you take the tweet and or the blog post and put it on Facebook, now you've got three links from Google Juice, and you've done it once. And over time, gradually your content builds I've been blogging on Franklin Matters for two years and decided to Google Franklin Mass and Franklin Matters was not in the first two or three pages on Google. And I was saying to myself, ah, why? What's the matter? If you Googled certain words, I would appear there. But if, if you looked for Franklin Mass, it's because I was assuming Everybody on the page already knew I was talking about the Franklin Town Council. So I just said Town Council. I didn't say Franklin Town Council. But from a search perspective, if you wanted to search for Franklin Town Council, now I'll appear closer in the top three pages, whereas before I wasn't there at all. And all I had to do, Franklin, comma, mass, colon, Town Council, agenda, date. 
Now I put it in there, and now it'll gradually flow through on the data piece. So it's just like little learning things that watching some statistics, paying attention to what's going on. Yeah. So, how do you start a blog? Determine what you what you want, why you want, what you're going to do, who you're going to reach. Right? You kind of need to know that, and then choose the platform. Now, platform meaning technologies. I'm somewhat Google oriented. I've got a Google account, Gmail account. I like Blogger. I've been using it. It's very successful. It was only a few years actually as I started getting into the nonprofit piece that I started getting uh, URLs so that they were personalized. Steve's Two Cents is still on blogspot.com, which some people say, ah, but it's fine. If you Google Steve Sherlock, Steve's Two Cents still comes up. It's there because I've got enough data behind it. So searchability, what kind, what's your domain name? There may be advantages in terms of specific domain names. So franklinmatters.org, franklinfoodpantry.org, right? Domains. Or right on the sidelines, quietpoet.com. It's not a .org in that case. <laughs> I'm just a quiet poet. Um, so WordPress, there are free versions and paid versions. You can get it so you can install it on your own server. Which then, if you don't have a server, you get a service provider. ISP host, you get a whole set of operations going that way. Or you can go Google. It's free. Maybe you pay for the URL, 10, 15, 20 bucks, depending on what your service provider is. But they have the host, they have the server. You don't have to worry about it. Your choice. Both work. Both work. And there were a bunch of others. I think TypePad is still around, but I see it less and less. Um, I'm trying to remember. There were some others, but I think most of the others that were there kind of like have really fallen. Tumblr, I think, is the fastest growing social network right now. I'm sorry, which one? Tumblr. Tumblr, right. Right. Weebly. Tumblr. Is Weebly's it? not bad either. <clears throat> yeah, and Weebly had been higher before, and then it's kind of disappeared somewhat from the radar. But I don't know it's easy. It, and and that it has some market because it's easy. Absolutely. So if you already have a website, and then you decide you want to start a blog, yes. If I'm using, if I choose one of these platforms you just mentioned, mm -hmm. is it a completely different entity from my website, and I just have to make sure it's linked both ways? It, it depends upon how you do it, but it could be, and thereby saying if you've got a headline, you can have a link to the blog, uh -huh. right? Or if you're hosting your website with a service provider and you do a WordPress install, then it can be in the same space. So that while they're clicking on the link, they're really going to your blog, which is still separate code set, but it's on the same server, same URL, etc. Okay. All right. <laughs> so I don't get into that much because one, this is a one-on-one -on -one session. Sure. Yeah. If you need help, we can certainly point you in the right directions that way. <clears throat> you started saying there were three levels of audience, the wide world. And yes, the oh, I didn't go to the third one, did I? The second one. No, I didn't even go to the second one. <laughs> so the people that don't know you, first level. Then the second level is the people who are partially engaged, right? So they may have heard about you, maybe at a conference like this. So they'll read you once in a while, or they'll go to your page once in a while, but they haven't subscribed. Or if they have subscribed, that's all they've done. Right? So they're partially engaged. They'll read, you'll see some activity in regards to the numbers, but you don't get an email, you don't get a con comment, you don't see shares so that they haven't shared your content with somebody else. Right? And depending upon how you do the metrics and analytics, etc., which could be an entire other session, there are ways that you can build that so you can find out how shareable. It was interesting just on the face, on the event front, in terms of the ticket sales, there were 100 Eventbrite links to LinkedIn, two of which resulted in ticket sales. There were 500 in another category that went to Facebook, which resulted in seven ticket sales. So there's a level of statistics that, depending upon 
what you've got and where it goes, you can see the statistics and find out where, ooh, yeah, that makes more sense. If, if that really generates the numbers, then do that. Don't do this. So there's reasons for analytics. And again, analytics will do. That's not kind of a one-on-one -on -one session. You want to get up and start it first. So an unengaged, partially engaged. And then the third one is that community set. They're engaged. They're the ones that, over time, you'll know them. Because they're talking to you via email, comment. And it's interesting, at least in the Franklin Matters world, I've got a set of folks who will comment via the Facebook page, a different set of folks who will comment via email, and yet a different set of folks who will comment on the blog directly. <coughs> Which perfectly makes sense because that's where they're at and how in their day, so they're spending just time going website to website so they'll comment on the blog. Somebody else lives in Facebook, so when they see a post, they'll comment in Facebook. That's fine by me. But it also provides me an opportunity, too, so if somebody says something here that's not said over here or not said over here, I can take that and then come back with something else, which helps kind of the self-sustaining content one of the other questions, how do you keep going? You look for other ways to, you know, listen and incorporate what it's telling you to either go that direction or deeper in this direction or don't do any more of that, maybe you don't want it. <laughs> so, unengaged community, partially engaged community, starting blog, um, blog presence, template, There's a couple of aspects to that. In terms of what you want to do and how you want to do it, you've got to have an idea of what your <coughs> image is going to be. What is your brand? What does your brand look like? Right? So now the page should be an image or fit within that context for your brand. You can go so far, and I'm in the process of setting up a Healthy Futures Franklin. It's kind of a consortium of government grant, local, wide, etc. I'm going to set up the web page. They just sent me a um, template guide in terms of these are the fonts, these are the colors. They've done some pre-thought. Usually, if somebody asks me to set up a website, you know, they haven't gone that far, but somebody has already determined this is the marketing context, logos, text, format, fonts, colors. Great, I'll just take that. Less thinking. <laughs> They've already done that thinking, now I can do the implementing. So you don't necessarily have to go that far right away, especially if yours is kind of like a personal blog. You can change your format over time. Do what's comfortable for you. Do what's comfortable looking at the stats as to what's going to work. Some will work better than others. I always encourage readability and accessibility. Because while everybody generally is focused on somebody that's, quote, normal, there are people high, uh, hard of sight and are hearing impaired where they won't necessarily read the page. They'll use a reader to read it to them orally. Right? So having things like the alt text, and if it's a term, just pay attention to it over time. But when you post a picture, you can have a caption <clears throat> so that when the reader gets to that caption, because obviously they're blind, they're being read what's on the page. So if there's no caption, then they know there's an image, but they don't know what the image is. But now if there's a caption in an alt text, now the reader can read that text and read to the blind person. It's a picture of whatever the caption says. Right. So that kind of accessibility and clearly, as, mo as many of we all will age, as we get older, our sight diminishes. So if you can have the capability of having like larger font sizes, darker text, and again, we'll focus on the contrast. So there, I see an awful lot of, and maybe it's just the trend, but there's an awful lot of gray on white. Gray on white is hard to read, <laughs> right? So I tend to go black text on white or very light background. You want a high contrast for your ability. You 
good. Because you're treating your readers. And if you treat your readers okay, and more than okay, they'll come back. Because if you start trying to read some good content and it's making you work, I'll go away. That's your dumb question about that. No, no, no. Always, there's no such thing as a dumb I question. I totally agree. I, I always go in my, in my posts and I make everything black. Because I see so much gray. Mm -hmm. But I've never known that I have to go in manually at all the time. Is there a way to set your default setting? There should <laughs> be. I haven't yeah. figured it out yet. Yeah, and, and depending on how I'm oh, again, I'm impressed, uh, There must be. Uh, <laughs> It, it is in that CSS. There must be a setting somewhere in there that says this is your default uh, font, text size, color. Sure. Yeah. Because Tom, I think you do that too, right? Mm -hmm. So, Melinda here or Tom, you get a couple of sources. It's the kind of good stuff because I know it's there and I know where I can find it in Blogger, but I don't use WordPress, so somebody else does. But it's, it. It is a good question. Absolutely. You do need to do that. So how are we doing time? That's pretty good. Uh, so I started the first part of the template, but then the second template, yours is really specific. So yeah, yeah. there are but, but there are some things that I've seen now because um, artist portfolios, more art in terms of either pictures and or paintings, they're getting different portfolio types so that they can showcase and now buy this painting or buy this print, right. et cetera. So I think what, at least to phrase the question, you're looking for something that would be kind of that platform that would allow them to showcase right. their and wares. Right, could be any place where you've got a community of people that you want to be able to contribute without your having to be involved. Yeah, so you want to make it kind of hands off. Yeah, you create a template, and you put it out there, and they can basically create a post, I think. Mm -hmm. That's fine. So, yeah. Harvard starting, at least in terms of, you know, deciding how are you going to start? What are you going to do? And then at some point in time, you've got your template, you've got your platform, you've got your service provider, you just start writing. You do that first post. You get it out there. <clears throat> and then you do the second post. Some people will go so far as to do an editorial calendar. Right? So it's one of the things that I'm trying to work with the pantry to do so that there's specific events during the year. So if something's coming in May, we want to start mentioning it in March and April so that it's not just a surprise. If you've got periodic things like that, an editorial calendar works very well. Even for your own, it can be just an outline, you know, a basic outline. I want to cover these topics or this topic, but then this aspect, this aspect, Oh, by the way, this leads to this, right? So it's an outline format. That's another way of thinking about it. And then it gives you some structure so that when you go to sit down Monday morning, it's not, now what do I write about? You've got your outline. Oh, I wrote about that. I wrote about that. I need to write about this. So to have something that people are actually going to want to look at, for instance, how often do you have to update it? I, you know, They'll look at some blog, you'll see them, and you know, yep. something pretty interesting, and then you, they won't have anything to say for yeah. a month. Or then and there's some people that are like, you know, po you putting real posts on there like five or six hours. Uh, when I was in school, there was a, one of the professors, I think she posted like 10 times a day. Yeah. And there are a variety of posts. Um, I've seen the entire spectrum. Um, one great writer, Patty Dye, uh, does a blog called 37 Days, um, came from her father who had been told he had 37 days to live and she had to figure out how to deal with that. So she's got an entire community and what she was doing was a weekly, effectively an essay. And I wrote a post about her at one point where I could picture her in the kitchen kind of deciding on Monday what she was going to do on Sunday. Tuesday, maybe she drafted a little bit, kind of putting the recipe together. She drafted, and then it took her the week. And then on Sunday, when it came out, uh, it was a joy to read. And that can work. Mm -hmm. I think the best answer in terms of, yeah, there's a spectrum, is 
you set your expectations for your readers as to how frequently you're going to post. So like from a Franklin Matters perspective, I need to be as current as I can in terms of, okay, there's a town council meeting on Wednesday, I'll give you the agenda on Monday to prepare for it, etc. So I'm posting on a daily basis, but I'm also, for my own personal work schedule, I post before 6 o'clock in the morning because after that I'm on the, going off to work. So it's rare that I'll post during the business day, but then I'll post at night when I'm at the meetings. I've set my expectations for the readership that way, and as long as I deliver, I'm fine. And do people just discover what you put out there, or is there some methodology to drive you, <coughs> drive them? I, I get that there's you know certain word search yeah. parameters or descriptors right. that you would want to right. use, but then is there some other way to drive traffic to the? There's other vehicles. So as part of the Franklin Matters, to use that as an example. There's a daily email that is part of that will come out. So whatever I've posted in the prior 24 hours comes out in the daily email. So I've got at least 230 or something email subscribers. I think the readership will vary. Um, it's usually about 1,000 page reads a day. But I know the 200 and something are going to get the email. And there are some metrics that I can see where that email occasionally will get resent to others. So it gets back to content that matters. So if I'm posting about the new high school and the budget situation, that's going to matter to somebody. Or if I'm doing you know, the new kindergarten playground, et cetera, that's going to hit them. So it, it depends. It'll vary. But ultimately, when you start looking for something, if they're going to turn to the web and start looking, you want to be found for those key terms that you're determining as your content area. So it's kind of a circular answer, but yeah. And the more you can make your items shareable, right? So within most templates, whether they're WordPress or Blogger, um, down at the bottom you can enable so that it can be shared via email, LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, G+. You know, you can enable as many of those as you want. That way it makes it easier for the reader to come and then share it in their networks on those platforms. And then somebody in those other circles, right? So now we have different circles. You have the one pond, different circles. You've put a drop out in the pond. It started circling. Somebody else sees it, and they put a drop out, and it goes through their circles. So eventually, those who have never heard of you may eventually, through three or four connections, say, oh, wait a minute. Hey, he's doing something over here I want. And then come. And then assuming you're doing stuff that they, it's in, they're locked on. Can I ask a really silly question? No, there's no silly questions, but you can certainly <laughs> ask. Well, yeah, I think part of the issue, I mean, I've been doing social media forever, and there are some questions that I've never asked, so I don't know the answer. And it gets to the point where it's ask. really embarrassing. Go ask. Especially as a social media marketing guru. <laughs> <laughs> There's the at sign and there's the hashtag. Yes. And, you know, I know that I'm not the only one in this room. It's not really clear exactly on when you should use one versus the other. Mm. Does anybody have a scene? Uh, well, the, the at sign, and Tom can certainly chime in. I know um, the at sign generally refers to the Twitter, Twitter handle. Yeah. All right, so that's your Twitter handle. So if you see that, that generally would be the Twitter account. So at sure Steve. Yeah at Franklin Matters, at Franklin Food Pan, those are the Twitter handles. Right. Right. The hashtag, like PCWM, yeah. is just the device that somebody creates. There's another one called the five, T-H-E five. Right. So now, anybody tagged that way, you can search. So, so you can come up in any search if you just go to Google and you do that. Google PCWM and you'll find a host of stuff. I mean, there's other things like in Facebook, if you do the, the hashtag, it will create a link, so there's other things. Correct. Like and Google Plus, with the hashtag, will create the link. <coughs> right. The hashtag kind of, or the plus sign. Well, the plus sign, right. Yes. Yeah, because the plus sign, if you start with the plus sign, it will attempt to find the person's name right. if they've got a Google Plus account. Right. But I mean, that's not, that's other stuff. Right. Yeah. So the hashtag, 
hashtag outside of Facebook is it's, for, it's, it's generally a Twitter search vehicle. Twitter? Well, search that's Twitter. where it came from okay. originally, because clearly Twitter is a stream, right? Right. So how did you find something set? And it works perfect at a conference like this, PodCamp Boston. Okay. So you can put the PCB, and you could just follow PCB, and you wouldn't have to know what Tom's handle was, or my handles, or Melinda's handle. You could just follow PCB and find out what's going on. So it gives you a way to filter in the stream, but also filtering, thereby you can find somebody. So if you go search on that to this term after, you can find the Twitter for the various people and say, oh yeah, you, I remember he talked to you in that session, et cetera. Right? So I know John, excuse me, Jeff yeah. in particular, when he goes on the website eventually, <laughs> I'll be watching to see if he actually does stuff because I know he said he was hesitant. So I, I'm, I'm not going to force him. It's his choice. So the other question would be related to that is: so if you don't know the discrete term, how do you search the the stream, right? So you, you want to find something, right? Right. Or, or you want to be found. Yeah. So how, how, yeah. how do those two things come together? So if you oh, don't know yeah. PodCamp, you know, whatever the initials right. you used for PodCamp, how do you find it? Yeah. A level of um, searchability, a level of distinction I also put on there as well. Um, so for example, um, yeah, I found the first PodCamp simply via, quote, the network. I have been part of kind of a virtual community that Rosa say who's out in Hawaii, and I still haven't ever met her. She had a blog. Chris Brogan posted on her blog that there was this thing called PodCamp Boston happening, et cetera. And I said, wait a minute, it's happening in Boston. It's free. I'm going to go there. But I found out from somebody in Hawaii, mm -hmm. right? And then once I was there, more and more and more and more connections mm -hmm. get made. So yeah, you get the one, and then you go explore. That's where, it, to a certain extent, it's kind of, you know, you can spend hours online, and I used to, because then what, I'd go to one site, and, oh, this is good, no, he's got a link there, oh, that's good, oh, that's good, look what he's doing, oh, and that's good. You go 49 different places, and you know, like an hour's gone by, and it's like, wait a minute, why? <laughs> but you learned some good stuff along the way, because you just kept digging, 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 digging. So then the other piece I'll use as a quick story for distinctness, you, you want to be, you know, distinct and findable. You know, uh, Seth Godin talks about the purple cow, right? On LinkedIn, I had, you know, experienced project manager. Pfft, yeah, thousands of experienced project <laughs> managers. I changed one word, and it's still there today. Savvy project manager. <laughs> the search hits went crazy because of the one word. Now, you don't want to pick an absurd word unless that's your intention, right? But savvy still kind of fit within my brand, I thought. Because, yeah, savvy has that, you know, I know how to go to skate, I know how to do this, I know how to figure things out, I can do this. And it seemed to have worked because the search hits certainly generated the phone calls and I got found. So words matter. Words matter. Um, I can, in terms of the fire circle story. Uh, it says this fire age. It looks like five circle story. Yeah, fire circle story. <laughs> okay. Um, it's the story of the three levels of the audience. I wrote it. I think it was in 2006, and then did an audio version of it. Um, if you Google fire circle story on Steve's two cents, it'll take you both to the written version and the audio version. It's kind of like in the short story, I think it's maybe seven minutes, a long story. The short story is, you know, in the olden days, we were in the circle. And it was the fire in the circle, and the shaman or whoever would tell and share stories. Those who were closest to the circle heard the story. If you were sleeping in the rocks, you didn't hear the story. Right? So the three levels of the community engagement, those were, so the people in the story, 
the shaman, then the words developed because a lot of things were sound based. There's some discussion as to whether music was actually the first language and then words came along later. <clears throat> and then words and songs and then we're continuing to evolve in terms of the fire service story. It's still ongoing. Now we're doing blogs, now we're yeah, doing Twitter, tweets, yeah. now we're doing, you know, tumblers and it, it's still going. We're just not around the fire service. But I think for us to be successful, we need to know navigate the fire circle and pick the circle we want to be around. And that's one of the things that PodCamp does because there was a prior discussion session, you know, kind of political activism around social media. I was there because of the community work I do in terms of Franklin Matters, but the discussions in there were just like, wow, <laughs> I've got more reading to do because there's more learnings there. Some of the in the apps that's been something that's been evolving over time. People are recognizing that because the entire app, especially with a mobile device, something on the mobile device you only got a two by three screen is a different resolution versus the desk, versus even the, the netbooks and or the tablets versus the full screens, right? So there's different formats there. There's an entire science around that as well. But from a blogger perspective, you want to make good content. And then when you chose your template, that should be one of the considerations. So I know WordPress and I know Blogger does have some things in there for those usabilities. Mm -hmm. So that they'll help you, you know, create so you can go, you know, small, medium, large text so that the user can choose what makes it easier for them to come to the site. And you should only have to choose that once. It's not something you have to choose all the time. Once you chose it, then the users, as they come to the site, you know, somebody can read it. Without glasses, that's fine. But somebody else may come want to kick it up a notch. Like there's an app called Readability, right? So that if yep. you pull that out and then put it in Readability and it does all sorts of things. And it'll do some calculation as to what grade level, et cetera, you're on. It reads to you and it changes the, the uh, font size, okay. the, the, yep. co the contrast. Okay. Um, but I guess my question is to, in creating a blog, do you have to? doing something so that when that app comes in, they can do that? Or does, does it, the app it, come in or public? Yeah. I, I think, as I understand it, yeah. you create the content, right. and then your choice of template right. should allow that other choice to be made as people okay. come. Right. Anything else? Um, for, so for someone who's just starting out with a blog, and let's say, I know I want text and photos, can you talk about the user-friendliness of the different options? And do people have a recommendation for the duck box? Is WordPress better than Google? Or you know, who, what, what's good about the <coughs> tab option? I've used WordPress a little bit just to say that I have. I've used TypePad, which the blog or currents kind of ended, et cetera. But I'm certainly a Google <coughs> guy, so I find those I'm more used to. I think the functionality is effectively there. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting because while Google has Picasa, which is kind of their picture app, I've long been a Flickr user. Mm -hmm. right? And Flickr makes it easy to take the URL and put it in a blog post, whether it's Google or WordPress. So it depends upon which places you're putting your content. And I, as I gravitate more to Picasa, the Picasa should make it easier to get into Google because they're Similar. Um, so I hope that answers somewhat, but it's not a perfect answer. Yes, dynamic views. Which is really neat. Yeah. 
in blogger. In blogger. In blogger. blogger. Yeah. Which is free and it's easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would can put out, we haven't really talked about it, but and more I think, and Tom, you may agree, in the older days or a few years ago, home page was the key. You had to have the home page. Realistically today, people will find you based upon your content and they'll get driven to that page. It may not be your home page. It's going to be that page. So the only real consideration is to make sure that once they land on your set of content, they can at least navigate around to find your home page and to find other things in order to subscribe, find other materials, etc. But don't spend so much time on your home page making a pity anymore because most of the readers are not going to come to the home page. They're going to come in via the good content that you've created, and it may come in like in that uh, 2008 piece. They're diving back into 2008. It's 2013. I've got more important meetings up here. Okay. But they're still diving back there because of that search term. So back to the whole search term thing. So is there like a compendium or a magic list of what the... I went to law school a few years ago, and I was using these mm -hmm. computer, you know, search tools. Yeah. I didn't know what what the real good terms were. Right. I went back to the digest, the old books. Yeah, yeah, I was beating yeah. the hell out of those kids too, because <laughs> the, because the the there, there's you know specific words that give you specific results. Correct. Correct. So where do you if if you're a novice at this, where do you yeah. how do you figure out? If, if you're in that kind of, you know, just as an example, you use that kind of legalese terms, then you want to be using the terms, and I think I mentioned the term too, whoever your audience is, you want to talk to them on their terms, right? Mm -hmm. So continuing, if you're a legalese, you want to be using those proper right. legal terms that will drop you into that set of content. If you're in gardening, then you want to talk in the right gardening terms to draw in the gardeners. So, so let's use and, and for an example. So what, would, what do you think would be the, the kinds of uh, terms that you would want to, you know, tag? Are those, is that the same thing as tags? Well, you can tag and you can label. Some of the labels on the blog also help searchability within the blog. So on Blogger, and I think WordPress does the same thing, if you tag it as, for example, town council or budget, you can now search budget and all the posts for budget 2014 come up. Right. You know, so you don't have to do anything. But that's special. an internal thing. That's an internal thing, but similar function can work via Google, Yahoo, etc. So if you put in that term, it's not it's going to get all those instances wherever they are, not just in your page. And then the more that's an industry standard term, mm -hmm. then the more the industry standard stuff will be found where you where you apply. So the other um, flipped away. There's a bunch of industry index classifications, right? Mm -hmm. Some of those terms might be appropriate. You could probably drive yourself crazy thinking about this. Huh? You could. You could. I haven't spent a lot of time on, con on search engine optimization. I focused on content. Mm -hmm. So if I figured that if I'm writing what's happening in Franklin, and it certainly has been proved, people, as I mentioned earlier, around the world are finding because I have town budget, school budget, you know, as long as it's in the English language, they're 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 coming. Here. They're finding what they need, and not that's another story, but they're finding it. So just focus on what you need to do. Deliver your content. Feed you know, the other piece. Going back to the feed the people who you are engaged with. Keep them happy. Because if you keep them happy, they'll continue to share. Their sharing will continue to expand your circles and circles and circles. And as Tom reiterated, it doesn't happen overnight. You will not put your first blog post out there tomorrow and be on number one Google the next day. No way. <laughs> no way. FaceTime. Franklin Matters since 2007 when I started. I think I'm about 100 shy of my 8,000 post in six years. A lot of content. So if you want the history of Franklin, you can come there. <laughs> if you don't want Franklin, stay away. <laughs> um, one more question. If Absolutely. You, will it find words that are in my post as opposed to tag? Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for your participation. Thank you for your questions. If you have others, by all means, I'm here the rest of the day. 
You can find me, just Google Steve, Stu Sher Steve Sherlock and you'll find Steve Stu Sets and whatever. I'll answer your questions outside after too. <laughs>